Excuse my suit. Uh, <laughs> this is like my Iron Man suit. Not that it gives me any special power, but I, I, I'm taught to preach in Korean churches always to uh, wear a suit, so I feel more comfortable wearing a suit. And uh, it has already been two months since I came to St. Paul's, and it has been such encouraging and challenging time of learning and growing. And it's always a great privilege to be standing in a pulpit and proclaim the gospel. Speaking in a pulpit is more meaningful to me because, because of my long struggle with God. And that long struggle led me here to this pulpit, led me here today. And for about 15 years, I struggled to figure out if God has called me to be a pastor. And there were several reasons for that struggle but there was this one very important question that always haunted me, and th that question was, does God love me? I knew in my heart that He loved me, but I just, not, I just was not feeling, that, feeling it. And I was, I was blinded by this worldly, worldly notion of love, and I understood love as something very passionate, and something that's filled with happy emotions. And when I didn't have that kind of emotions, most of the days, doubts were creeping in. And I was afraid that if someone asked me this question, how do you know that God loves you? And I would not be able to answer. I know that in my head that Jesus died for me and saved me from my sins. And that's how, how, that's how God loves me. I know that in my head, but in my heart, I was just not feeling it. Then four years ago, my dad had a severe stroke. So this, my dad is a big man and very strong. But after his stroke, he, was, he could not move, he could not speak, and he was totally helpless. So I was looking at it one day. And this question came to my mind. Would God still love my dad? So I thought, thought about that question several, for several days. And after several days of thinking, the conclusion that I got was a resounding yes. Yes, God still loves my dad. But then the next question came into my head. So then, if God loves my dad, how would my dad glorify God? So I thought about that question for several days. And I found out that the, the question I asked was not quite correct. Because there was one thing that my dad could do. And that one thing was to accept God's love. To accept God's love shown by my dad's family, friends, and the church. So that's when my blindness lifted, and I was able to see that God loved me as I am, just as I am. Not for what I did, not for what I could do, but for just for who I am, He loved me. And ironically, so my dad's suffering has healed my blindness. And in today's passage, Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to 50, 51, we also have a story of a blind man. And in verse 46 it says, Then they reached Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Bartimaeus, was sitting beside the road. And this story, this story of a blind man, it forms a sandwich with a, a story, another healing of a blind man's story in Mark chapter 8. So one in Mark chapter 10 and one in Mark chapter 8. They form a sandwich. And this structure is very important later. So please remember that they form a sandwich. And in Mark chapter 8, we do not have the man's name. But here, we know his name. Well, actually, it's his dad's name. 
and it is Timaeus. And the blind beggar is just called Timaeus' son. But the fact that his name is recorded tells us that he was a very important eyewitness for Mark. And let us continue on to see the important role that he played. So in verse 47 it says, When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Timaeus' son, he could not see, but he was able to hear. So he, was, he picked up some name while he was begging that was being talked among the people. So Jesus of Nazareth. The name Jesus was common at the time. But Jesus of Nazareth distinguished Jesus from all other Jesuses. And Nazareth was a small, insignificant town. Yet Jesus made such an impact among the Jews that when Timaeus' son heard that name, Jesus of Nazareth, he knew immediately that Jesus, this Jesus is the one he was waiting for, and he needed that Jesus. So imagine Timaeus' son begging on the street, spare some change, spare some change, and suddenly hearing, Jesus of Nazareth. His heart is pumping. Jesus is really here. He can cure me. Finally, I can be healed. So, Timaeus' son, he went from having no hope to all of a sudden full of hope. And I hope that the name Jesus, name Jesus would have the same kind of impact on you when you have when you are in a situation that's hopeless, may the name Jesus bring you to become full of hope. And Timaeus' son, he, Timaeus son cannot miss this chance, this, this only chance that he can be healed. So he shouts, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. <coughs> and interestingly, Jesus is called son of David, and this is the first time in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus is called Son of David. So Jews, not even not, none of the disciples, they never call Jesus Son of David. And Timaeus' son, he called him Son of David, and Jews were expecting a Messiah to come as a new Davidic king. So by, by calling Jesus Son of David, Timaeus' son was saying that Jesus is the Messiah and he was preparing for his entry to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is known as the city of David. So Timaeus' son is, is preparing Jesus, son of David, to enter the city of David. And at the, at the time, as you may be aware, the Pharisees and other religious leaders, they hated Jesus. And they did not acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah. So on Timaeus' son's part, calling Jesus as the son of David took great courage and faith. But when this is the only chance for healing, there is no stopping Timaeus' son. He shouted again and again, lest Jesus would just pass him by. Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. And he was making so much noise that in verse 48, he says, Be quiet. Many of the people yelled at him. But he only shouted louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. So now why, why do you suppose that people yelled at him to be quiet? Is it just because he was being very, very noisy? Or is, it, is there something else? To answer this question, we need to contrast the crowd and the beggar. Jesus left Jericho and he was on his way to Jerusalem and a large crowd and the disciples followed him. Why did they follow him? To make him the king of the Jews, which we see people try to do in the next chapter, chapter 11, as Jesus rides a donkey to enter Jerusalem and people shout, Hosanna! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. And the crowd followed him to rise in revolt against Rome. 
So they did not want, want the Roman soldiers to find out their ploy from a, meager, a mere beggar. So they, they tried to quiet him, but they could not quiet him. Timaeus' son just shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me! And here we see an irony. The crowd who could see physically, they were not able to see who Jesus really was. They did, not, they did not see that Jesus came to save us from our sins. They saw Jesus only as someone who would, who would free them from the Roman Empire. But the beggar, who could not see physically, he was able to see that Jesus came to save us from our sins. So in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, Jesus tells us exactly why he came to this, this earth. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. So based on what, this, what Jesus' mission is, Timaeus' son has all the right to shout, have mercy on me. And in verse 49, he says, When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, Tell him to come here. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come on, he's calling you. Then in verse 50, Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. I've gone out to several street evangelism. Uh, I, I visited uh, homeless shelters in downtown Toronto. And we would be walking for about three hours a night, walking from shelter to shelter and talking to homeless people and praying for them and handing out clothing and blanket, blankets in, in, the, in the winter times. And one thing I noticed is how some homeless people on the streets, they treasure their possessions and they would never leave them unguarded. And they have all their belongings in this big garbage bag and they carry it around, carry around, them, around with them all day. So the fact that Timaeus', Timaeus son throwing, throwing aside his coat is like a homeless leaving his garbage bag unattended. It's like having your front door open, wide open. So for Timaeus' son, his coat would have protected him from the cold of the night and he would have kept other valuables inside his coat so that no one can take them. But when Jesus called him, he left them, everything, he left them, left them, and he ran to Jesus. And in verse 40, 51, it says, What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. My rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. May his son call Jesus my rabbi. And in all four Gospels, only Timaeus' son and Mary calls Jesus my rabbi, my teacher. It's a title of honor, and also it's a title that's more intimate. Timaeus', Timaeus son showed his passion to be healed, and he was not afraid to leave his possessions behind to follow Jesus. And by calling Jesus my teacher, we can see that he was really waiting for this moment, and he was really feeling intimate with Jesus. So when Jesus asked him, what can I do for you? His answer was very simple and direct. I want to see. So in verse 52, he says, And Jesus said to him, Go, for your faith has healed you. Instantly the man could see, and he followed Jesus down the road. Jesus declares that it was the beggar's faith that healed him, but we know that our faith comes from God. So what Jesus is saying is that the beggar received the faith that God gave him and the faith that, beggar, that God, God placed in the beggar, it worked the miracle of healing his blindness. And immediately he was able to see. And more importantly, he followed Jesus down the road. That's, more, that's the more important effect of the healing of the blindness, to be able to see that Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem to suffer and to die. 
and to follow after him. This is more important. This is the mark of a true disciple. So now I want to explain why this healing story is important. Is this just another miracle story to entertain us and teach us about Jesus' power? I've mentioned that the two healings, healing of a blind man stories, they form a sandwich. And in the middle of the sandwich is the meat of the sandwich, and it's, the, it's, it's about the disciples' blindness. They are so, so blinded when Jesus reveals to his disciples that he is going to suffer and die. The disciples just do not get it. So the blind man actually represents the spiritual ignorance of the disciples. They have been with Jesus for quite a while now. Yet, they only see Jesus as triumphant, rather than seeing Jesus as the suffering servant. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus fed 4,000 people with just seven loaves of bread and a few small fish. Then afterwards, the disciples forgot to pack the leftovers, and later they were arguing with it among one another, who was responsible for not packing it because they had no food to eat. But after such a big miracle of feeding 4,000 people, they were fighting over such a small, petty problem. So Jesus rebuked them. Don't you understand yet? Later in Mark ch chapter 8, verse 31, then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but three days later, he would rise from the dead. And then in, right, in, right after that, in verse 32, Peter takes Jesus aside and he reprimands his teaching. He might have some, said something like this, Jesus, come on, you're not supposed to say that you're, not, you're going to die. You're supposed to be a messiah. You're supposed to defeat Roman Empire and free us from them. <coughs> but do you see that Peter is spiritually blinded? He has his own idea about Messiah and cannot understand what Jesus is saying to him. Here, as you, as you may remember, Jesus speaks very harshly to Peter. Get away from me, Satan, he says. Is Jesus saying that the source of blindness, spiritual blindness, the source is Satan? Just a question for you to think about. Then we move on to chapter 9, and the spiritual blindness just continues. Jesus told them for the second time about his suffering and death in chapter 9, verse 31. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of his enemies. He will be killed, but three days later, he will rise from the dead. And verse 32, it says, Disciples, they didn't understand what he was saying, however, and they were afraid to ask him what he meant. The disciples are thinking, why does he keep saying that he's going to die? This is making me so uncomfortable. But they did not want to be rebuked by Jesus again, so they did not ask. And in chapter 10, for the third time, Jesus teaches that he would die in chapter 10, Verses 33 to 34. Listen, he said, we're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to die and hand him over to the Romans. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him with a whip, and kill him. But after three days, he will rise again. Is the third, third time the charm? No. The disciples still have no clue. This time, James and John came to Jesus right after and asked him in chapter 10, verse 37, When you sit on your glorious throne, Jesus, we want to sit in places of honor next to you. Jesus is talking about suffering, and they're like, Never mind suffering, we want glory. And then this is when Jesus heals Timaeus' son. This is when our passage today comes into place. He heals Timaeus' son, trying to show how blinded, blinded the disciples were. So between the two stories of a healing of a blind man, Jesus repeats three times, I am going to suffer and die. And the disciples are like, what? 
What does that mean? But in the end, we see that Jesus did heal the disciples' spiritual blindness. And after they met the risen Lord, they finally saw what Jesus meant. They finally understood that Jesus will not be saving them from the Roman Empire, but be saving them from something much, much bigger, from spiritual death and restoring the kingdom of God. <coughs> well, that was 2,000 years ago. And now that it has been 2,000 years since we studied about Jesus in the Bible, do we, know, do, we, do we know him? Do we see him clearly? Or are we still blinded? What do you think? I claim that the church is currently facing a time of blindness and that it will only get darker if left alone. I want to call it a dark age, hence today's title, Dark Age Ahead. Dark Age Ahead is the title of a book written by Jane Jacobs, exploring that our global culture is entering a new dark age with a dramatic loss of knowledge and wisdom. And dark age, as you know, is a term used to refer to the Middle Ages between approximately 5th century to 15th century, during which many societies in Europe they experienced overall decline. Now, when I say that church is facing the dark age ahead, I'm using the term as a metaphor because I'm talking about the symptoms of blindness that the church now and in the future will be experiencing. By the symptoms of blindness, I mean how our attention is being turned away from our Lord Jesus Christ to other things in this world. We are experiencing loss of memory where there is lack of emphasis on tradition and history, and loss of institutions where fewer people will attend church on any given Sunday, and many choosing to have their worship in their living room, and loss of consensus where people don't agree on absolute truth anymore. And these are the seeds of dark ages. So what is causing all this loss? It all started with started with the introduction of machines. With the introduction of, introduction of machines came the Industrial Revolution, as you know. And with the Industrial Revolution, one thing became very important, and that's, that's measurement, to measure things. We started to quantify everything. So did you know that before 1792, in schools, there were no grades given to students? Academic abilities were not measured back then, but nowadays, how miserable are we making the stu students giving them poor marks, telling them that you're not smart? Many of us have struggled with the measurements given in schools, and with the introduction of measurements came the emphasis on management for efficiency. So there's, if there's something to quantify, now we want more. So when, when, once we start measuring something, we want to be efficient and we want to make more of it. And we want better grades, we want to make more money, we want more people in the church. And this wanting for more has led to ideologies such as capitalism and consumerism, which is so deeply embedded in our culture that it has blinded the church. I mean, we don't see what we need to see. We don't see what we ought to seek. So what does, what does Jesus teach us to seek first in Matthew 6, 33? To seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. But with the advancement, advancement of technology, it makes us ever more dependent on it and makes us to seek the materials first instead of seeking his kingdom and his righteousness. And with the advancement of science, there is lesser and lesser room for God in our lives when everything seems to be ex explicable by the logic of science. When we want more, 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 there is less and less room for suffering and less and less room for sacrifice. So we, the church, as one body of Christ, we need Jesus' healing. We need to cry together as Timaeus' son did, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. 
as we are going deeper and deeper into the dark age, and as the world tries to get stronger hold of us, we cry harder and harder, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. And Jesus will call us and ask us, what can I do for you? And what would, you, what would, he, what would we say? We say, we want to see you, Jesus. We want to follow you with all our hearts. We seek your kingdom and your righteousness first. So for your connections card, you see, this will be the first point. I will ask Jesus to heal my blindness so that I may seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness. I repeat that. I will ask Jesus to heal my blindness so that I may seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness. Now the Apostle Paul, he also teaches us similar things in Romans 12 too. He says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. We are being blinded by the behaviors and customs of, of, customs of this world, and we are missing out of learning good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Good, pleasing, and perfect will of God for our lives and for the church. And this is the second point for your connection card. I will ask Jesus to heal my blindness so I may know the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. I will ask to heal I will ask Jesus to heal my blindness so, so I may know the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. And may we, be, may we be reminded that something that Jesus said in Mark 8, 34. If any one of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. As Timaeus' son threw his coat and was healed and followed Jesus on his way to suffering and death, may we seek Jesus and his healing of our blindness so that we can throw our worldly ways and be transformed and learn the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God in our lives and be able to follow Jesus on his way to the cross. Amen. As we conclude, we're going to stand and sing Mighty to Save. <laughs> 